So logistic regression in chapter 10.6, we use this when your dependent variable is dichotomous. A binomial logistic regression attempts to predict the probability that an observation falls into one of two categories of a dichotomous dependent variable based on one or more independent variables that can be either continuous or categorical. Unlike linear regression, you're not attempting to determine the predicted value of the dependent variable, but the probability of being in a particular category of the dependent variable given the independent variables. An observation is assigned to whichever category is pred predicted as most likely. As with other types of regression, binomial logistic regression can also use interactions between independent variables to predict the dependent variable. So here's the binomial logistic equation. Uh, where beta naught is the intercept, beta one is the slope parameter, also called the slope uh, coefficient for the first variable, x1. E represents the errors, and a logit is the natural log of the odds of an event occurring. It has little direct meaning, but if we apply the anti-log, which is Euler's number E, it can provide predicted percentage of correctly classified cases as odds ratios. I'll go into this a little bit more here. A procedure for finding a regression equation in which the re response, the dependent variable, is a dummy dichotomous variable. If the logit model, in the logit model, the log odds of the outcome is modeled as a linear combination of the predictor variables. So a logit of the probability is the natural log of, prob of the odds, where beta naught, beta 1x, etc., all the way to error. The number e, Euler's number, not the same as this e, these are not, this is error is a mathematical constant approximately equal to 2.71828, and it just goes on and on like pi, and is the base of the natural logarithm that is the unique number whose natural logarithm equals 1. So if I take the uh, beta coefficients, these slope coefficients, and exponentiate them, I find the odds ratio for each predictor. We won't do that, SPSS will. Okay, so again, remember we talked about dum dummy variables, a variable that has only values 1 and 0 that are used to represent two different categories of a nominal qualitative variable. We have seen this before in multiple regression where we compared males and females levels of VO2 max. When you dummy code, you need one less variable than the number of levels. So when we have a gender variable of two levels, males and females, we only need one variable. Males was equal to 1, females were equal to 0, and females are the reference category. So logistic regression is based on maximum likelihood es estimation, which need, needs large samples. Prevalence of the outcomes in a population can affect the number needed for sample sizes. Also, the balance between the zeros and ones, as well as the number of observations per independent variable, can impact the findings. So we have quite a few assumptions. First, you have to have a dichotomous outcome variable or a dependent variable, so it's got to be nominal with two outcomes. For example, died or survived, diseased or not diseased, failed or passed. The second assumption is that you have one or more independent variable. You have independence of observations, and all categories of nominal variables, either dependent or independent variables, need to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. You can't do an SPSS test for this. This is by your design. Four, you should have at least 15 cases per independent variable. Therefore, if you have three independent variables, you need to have at least 45 at the very least. Some recommend 50 per independent variable. So then you would, if you had three independent variables, you would need at least 150 in your data set. There should be a linear relationship between the continuous independent variables and the logit transformation of the dependent variable. There should be no multicollinearity, and there should be no significant outliers, leverential or, leverage or influential points. We can test these, uh, the, these last three with SPSS. Okay, so here's our scenario. A health researcher wants to be able to predict whether the incidence of heart disease can be predicted based on age, weight, gender, and maximal aerobic capacity, which is the VO2 max an indicator of fitness and health. The researcher recruited 100 participants to perform a maximum VO2 max test, as well as reporting their age, weight, and gender. The participants were also evaluated for the presence of heart disease. A logistic regression was then run to determine whether the presence of heart disease could be predicted from their VO2 max age, weight, and gender. Note, this, these data are uh, fictitious. So, research question. Do age, weight, gender, and maximal aerobic capacity predict heart disease. So here's our uh, data set. 
This is now the dependent variable heart disease coded zero for no, no heart disease and one for yes. Okay, so assumption number five, there needs to be a linear relationship between the continuous independent variables and the logit transformation of the dependent variable. You can use the box Tidwell procedure, but it's very complex. I have to go and change every independent variable to the log, log, natural log transformation and then run a series of regressions. If the interaction term is significant, then it's not linear related to the logit of the DV. So it fails the assumptions. Like most tests like this, we don't want it to be significant. We're not going to do this assumption to check for non-real data. If you have real data, I can show you how to do this. But for now, we're just going to move forward and say we meet this assumption. Number six, your data must not show multicollinearity, which is the high intercorrelations among two or more independent variables in a multiple regression model. We can test this by looking at the VIF intolerance, but we need to use the multiple regression procedure because you can't do it in the logistic regression procedure. So we're, we're going to do that first. So really quickly, we just go to Analyze Regression Linear. We're going to click move over all the variables here. Then we'll just click Statistics, and we're going to look at the collinearity diagnostics. Okay, we look and we see that nothing is um, greater than, or rather all of them are less than 10, some say less than 5, so we have no multicollinearity. So we'll go back to the um, logistic regression procedure. So number 7, there should be no significant outliers, high level leverage, or highly influential points. We will test that when we run the regression. So let's run the logistic regression. We're going to predict the heart disease by using all of the variables as independent variables. So we go to Analyze, re Regression, and now we skip linear and we go down to Binary Logistic. Okay, for, well first we bring over heart disease, which is our dependent variable, and then we bring over age, weight, gender, and VO2 max, right? But gender is special because it is a categorical variable, the rest are continuous. So we're going to click Categorical and bring gender over. Click. Uh, so I've done a click categorical button. Now we have females is equal to zero and males is equal to one. We keep it as first so we can compare males to females. Females will be the reference category and then we click continue. All right, now we click options and we want classification plots, plots, Hosmer, Lemeshaw, goodness of fit, case-wise listing of residuals, and then we want the confidence intervals for the exponentiated betas, 95%. That's just, this is auto-populated. We just have to click it. Um, and then we want at last step, display at last step. And then we also want to include the constant in the model. We click continue. Um, and then we're going to click save. We're going to check probabilities and then include the covariance matrix. Click continue, click OK. So then we scroll to the bottom of our output and we get this groovy looking um, graph. It's fancy, but it's not super informative, so we'll just keep going. The first thing we want to do is look at our outliers, so check the assumptions. So we scroll to the bottom of the output at the column indicated here in the Z residuals. If your standardized residuals are less than plus or minus two, it won't even produce this table. So you just assume, like, if you don't get this table, then you're fine. You, you can say you, you've met that assumption. If you successfully remove an outlier, so say you go through here, this guy is beyond three, plus or minus uh, three, this one's beyond plus or minus two. If you went and, and eliminated these, then the case-wise diagnostics table produced the first time you ran the, uh, the analysis might not then be produced the second time around. So don't, don't, get, don't panic if you don't see it the second time around. So no, there are different types of residuals that can be used to, de to, to detect outliers, standardized residuals, studentized residuals, or studentized deleted residuals. The default is uh, that we we get uh, standardized residuals, and we're going to just leave it because our data is our data, and even though we have an outlier, we're still going to just keep it. Um, there was one standardized residual with a value of 3.349 standard deviations, which was kept in the analysis. Okay, so then we go back up to the top of our output, and we see what we get. We get a case processing summary tells us if there are any missing data. All right, we have no missing data. The dependent variable encoding lets us check that we have coded our dependent variable correctly. Categorical variable coding showed us if any levels of our categorical variables have low count, counts, which is not good. So we have fairly balanced, I mean, not super balanced, but 
more than 15 in each category, so that's good. All right, then we keep going. Block zero. See up here, block zero, beginning block. Me block means we have no predictors in this model, just the constant, also called the null model. This classification table, it's just like a contingency table, shows that without any independent variables, the best guess here is 65%. If you, uh, is to simply assume that all participants did not have heart disease. If you assume this, you will overall collect correctly classify 65% of cases, which is this overall percentage row here. Okay, so we go to block one, which is the omnibus test of model coefficients, which provides the overall significance of the model, how well the model predicts categories compared to the null model with no independent variables. You wanna look at the model row, it's significant. So model will be where you report your findings. So uh, model of chi-square of four degrees of freedom is equal to 27.4. P is less than 0 0.001. So we have these two in the model summary. We have negative two log likelihood, Cox and Snell, and Nagelkirke R-square. The Cox and Snell R-square, or the Nagelkirke R-square, which I spelled wrong here, are pseudo R-squares. They work like regular R-squares. How much variance is explained by the model? We'll use this last one, the Nagelkirke. The hosmer lemischau test um, is kind of like the Levine's or the Shapiro-Wilkes. You don't want this to be significant because if it is, then you don't have a good fit. But if it isn't significant, then you do have a good fit. Okay, you can just ignore this top table here. It showed us that we had 65%, that we, we predicted 65% of those with heart disease. Now we went up to 71. So here in the classification table, you can see that our sensitivity in blue, uh, th this is the yes for heart disease, also known as the true positives. In this case, we have 45.7% uh, sensitivity in the red specificity. Here we have the true negatives, those who have no for heart disease and are also, and don't have it. Uh, that's 84.6% of the participants who did not have heart disease were correctly predicted by the model not to have heart disease. Positive predictive value is here in the, this column. Right, so if we, it's the percentage of correctly predicted cases with the observed characteristic compared to the total number of cases predicted as having the characteristic. So in this case, this yes divided by the total, 10 plus 16, which is 61.5%. Negative predictive value is this column, so the nose and nose, so 55 divided by 55 plus 19, which is 74.3%. Now, we can also use our, we asked in the save option to create the predicted probabilities. So if you were to go back to your data set at this point, you would see this variable that is now um, created. It's, it would be in this list down here. I click it and move it over. And now we have the predicted probabilities. And we can actually do our ROC curve to see how well it discriminates those with and without the, the condition. So we go to Analyze, Classify, Rock Curve, move the predicted probabilities over to the test variable, move the heart disease, the dependent variable is now our um, independent variable, to, to the state variable and put the value of one for those with heart disease. Check Rock Curve, check Diagnostic Diagonal Reference Line and Standard Error and Confidence Interval. And we can see we did a pretty good job. Here's our rock curve. The area under the curve is 0 0.80. And we know from down here that those between 0 0.8 and 0 0.9 is excellent discrimination. Um, and so the area under the, the ROC curve was 0 0.804, 95% confidence interval. I'll write that out, which is an excellent level of discrimination according to Hosmer et al. And here's the citation. Okay, now the variables in the equation table shows the contribution of each independent variable to the model and its statistical significance. So we can see that weight was not a significant predictor. However, VO2 max, gender, and age were. So in the EXP um, variable, these are odds ratios. So if it's greater than one, it's more likely. If it's less than one, it's less likely. So I'll, I'll read this out. The EXP, the exponentiated beta column, along with their confidence intervals, this informs you of the change in odds for each unit increase of the independent variable. For example, for gender, an increase in one unit going from female to male increases the odds by 
0.026. What this means is that the odds of having heart disease, being in the yes category, is 7.026 times greater for males as opposed to females. Values less than point at 1.00 indicated decreased odds for an increase in one unit of the independent variable. Okay, so let's write it up in APA. A binomial logistic regression was performed to determine the effects of age, weight, gender, and VO2 max on the likelihood that participants have heart disease. The logistic regression model was statistically significant, chi-square, four degrees of freedom, 20, is equal to 27.4, p is less than 0 0.001. The model explained 33% nagel kirke R-square of the variance in heart disease and correctly classified 71% of the cases. Sensitivity was 45.7%, specificity was 84.6%, positive predictive value was 61.5%, and negative predictive value was 74.3%. Of the four predictive variables, only three were statistically significant, age, gender, and VO2 max, as shown in Table 1 above. Males had 7.02 times higher odds to exhibit heart disease in females. Increasing age was associated with an increased likelihood of exhibiting heart disease, but increasing VO2 max was associated with a reduction in the likelihood of exhibiting heart disease. Okay, I just want to show you one other thing. We can also do ordinal logistic regression when your dependent variable is ordinal. So you can predict an ordinal dependent variable of more than two, two values. So you could have strongly disagree, disagree, agree, strongly agree, or some, some other type of ordinal variable. Um, it will allow you, when you do this type of ordinal regression, it will allow you to determine which of your independent variables, if any, have a statistically significant effect on your DV, and to, to determine how well your ordinal logistic regression model predicts the dependent variable, and it also allows the interactions between independent variables to predict the dependent variable. For now, we're just going to stick with binomial.